Hello, my name is Erin. I'm from Alberta. I'm not from British Columbia. Um, and I would just, it's not so much a question as just, I would just like to speak from a non-Indigenous context because um, where I'm from, we're not, it's not an Indigenous struggle, but it is a struggle um, that's happening in my community. So, and before that, I would just like to thank all of the people who have spoken. It's been inspiring. It's been inf informing. Um, it's just been such a great opportunity to listen to your struggle and to learn from that. Um, so I come from East Central Alberta. I live in the Battle River watershed, which is a prairie-fed watershed. Um, we don't get any water in our river from glaciers. Um, the headwaters are this tiny little lake called Battle River. Um, and there has been a pr proposal to frack beneath this lake. Um, and yeah, so this is a struggle that's happening in my community. Um, and we have largely, you know, white settlers, non-indigenous people who are part of this struggle. We do have local indigenous people involved as well. Um, but I would just like to, you know, echo what Caleb said that, yes, there are a lot of struggles that are happening on non-ceded, unceded territory and on indigenous lands, but also on white lands, private lands, settler lands. Um, I grew up on a farm. I grew up listening to my elder, my grandmother's stories about land and about my ancestors. I'm a I think fourth, fourth generation Canadian on both sides. Um, I grew up walking in the forests, learning about, you know, what mushrooms I can eat, where the deer have browsed. Um, so that land that I grew up on is sacred to me. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to put that forward that these struggles are not just indigenous struggles, but white struggles as well. So thank you. So um, <clears throat> what are your thoughts on sort of principles of accountability that settlers working in solidarity with indigenous-led struggles um, should take on um, and sort of? We've had a lot of experience working with um, settlers coming in and offering support on the front lines. And uh, I, th I think um, we can easily differentiate if we look through our records on the settlers that were most effective and the settlers that were least effect, effective. Um, the most effective ones were the ones that didn't walk away with a sense of entitlement or a sense of privilege to try and start making decisions on their own. Uh, the good ones were the ones that asked questions and asked permission to Frida and her clan when, it was, when, they, were, when they were organizing in their own communities or uh, if they were doing fundraising, that sort of, sort of stuff. They, they, they actually went to Frida and her client and asked permission to see if it was all right to begin commencing some type of support thing. And I, I think that that goes a long ways because uh, you know, during my presentation, I talked a bit about um, going past the symbolic nature of acknowledging indigenous people on our lands and actually doing something. And I, think, I think that says a lot if people can kind of you have that as a takeaway from the, um, our presentation or my presentation specifically. Um, if they can take that away and walk with that in, in a good, healthy way so that it benefits um, not just yourself but the indigenous people, especially the indigenous people who own those territories. So yeah, uh, for accountability, I think it's really important to think about um, the owners, owners of the lands. I <coughs> I was involved in uh, supporting the uh, uh, Silcoteen people in their struggle against Tezico Mines Limited, uh, the so-called Prosperity Mine uh, 1 and 2. And there was a group there called the Friends of Nehemiah Valley. And they stood with the Chilcotin people through that entire battle. And very effective group. Um, uh, they uh, 
became a very significant voice in that battle. Um, I know in my own home community, um, uh, quite some time ago, we had a, a, a big uh, fight with uh, some developers that wanted to come in and turn our local ski hill into uh, another Whistler. And uh, we were at the barricades for, I think, 38 days or something like that. <clears throat> And there was a group in Penticton which, you know, was pretty racist. Uh, there was a group that did materialize to support the community. There were three of our Okanagan Nation communities who were opposing that resort because it was in all of our watersheds. So generally speaking, there's always an opportunity for those groups. But I think generally speaking, there's a lot of organizations around uh, one that comes to mind that we work with uh, is the Wilderness Committee, like different groups like that that have worked alongside us. And, that, you know, they've been very much part of the rallies and the marches and in the Enbridge fight, the Kinder Morgan fight, and, and so on and so forth. Um, um, my worldview is very much, um, you know, what, what, what I just... When he's describing is it, it's uh, we're in it together and you know it's about uh, protecting and defending mother earth and quite often I talk about the ancient prophecy that the day would come when all of the races of people would come together for one express purpose of defending mother earth and quite often I say I believe that time is upon us so it's um, um, you know, it's, uh, we, we share the air, right? We share the water. And when it comes right down to it, we share the land. So we've got to make sure that, um, you know, we push back the corporate agenda that seeks to exploit all of the above, right? That's who the enemy is. And unfortunately, governments are the handmaiden of the corporations, right? Hi there. Thank you to both of you. I had a, a comment from uh, one of our um, listeners in New Brunswick that I wanted to share. It was a comment from, from Ann Pohl, who spoke uh, last night on one of our panels at the forum in New Brunswick. And she says, here in New Brunswick, we've made submissions to the RCMP's civilian commission around the abuses that happened here. It may be useful for you to look, at, uh, to look into that and make submissions as well. I'd be very willing to talk to you more about that process if you would like. And then she adds, they're treating our, the investigation of, our, um, of ours as an isolated incident. But it is clear that you were experiencing the same thing at around the same time as us. And it needs to be treated as a systemic issue happening across the country. Hi, my name is Tamiko. This is more a comment to the people that are, are here. Um, and it's about something that uh, I'm on the uh, Environment Committee and the Unitarian Church. And last spring, we organized a rally against Imperial Medals to protest them um, reopening Mount Polly and the Red Chris Mine. And so, you know, we're all just organizing it away. And then within two days of us posting it online, um, the VP of Imperial Medals calls our church with vaguely threatening comments. And it was actually terrifying. And so we all start to sort of second guess ourselves and worry about um, <coughs> CRA, which is really big. And uh, you know maybe we should cancel this. And then I got um, word from the Sequoia women at Mount Polly and um, some, <coughs> excuse me, women from the Taltan, the Klebona keepers up at Red Chris. And they were going, oh my god, you got you got response in two days. We've been waiting six months for anything. And, and she's saying, the power of the colonial. And then she's going, OK, sorry, sorry, sorry. The power of little old, lady, little old church ladies and gentlemen. It's, it's huge. And so we've got to remember that we have a lot of power, and we need to use it. And you know, this is awesome that we, um, we did our little rally, but we could do so much more. So. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Priscilla Michelle. I'm Unistoten. I wanted to not come up and ask a question. I wanted to express my deepest appreciation to these two gentlemen that are sitting up here today. Just want to hold my hands up to Togastai, who's been very instrumental in helping us with our fight on our Yinta. A strong Wet'suwet'en warrior that is helping us impact change because he knows that it's not only us as Unistoten that will be affected by this fight. It's him, his children, his grandchildren. And this summer we were invited out to the islands by our friend Debbie. He's here with his wife and to garner more support around our fight with this big monster industry that's trying to take over our territories and destroy it to their benefit. And I can't tell you how comforting it is when we come out to our camp and we have friends like Togastai that are there supporting us on the front lines and other important people that come and join us every year and spend months at a time away from their families, away from their jobs, and um, sacrificing. Like Warner said, Togastai, what are you willing to do? We see it firsthand with every person that comes out to our, our camp, our community, that Frida and Togastai built. And everybody that's come out to this conference, you're contributing to that by raising more awareness of the negative impacts that fracking will have, not only to us as First Nations, but to each of you and your future generations as well. And I also want to thank Grand Chief Stuart Phillip. We hold him up to the highest regard for the work that you do. He doesn't just talk about, stand, talk about the front lines, he's at the front lines and we see it. We see it so much and we're just so thankful that you're with us as Unistaten and we understand the impact it had on you, but we also understand that deep down inside, that's who you are. And that's a legacy that you're going to leave behind for your grandchildren. They're going to hear about Grand Chief Stuart Phillip. And they're going to hear that name for many years to come. And they're going to come forward like me. And they're going to say, that was my grandfather. He was there. And he did that. Regardless of what kind of implications that came along with that. Because you believe in it deep down in your heart. Just like how we listened to Alma this morning. She brought me to tears listening to her speech. And when we have people like you and Alma on the front lines and speaking the truth, it gives us that glimmer of hope that we need to keep moving forward. And just can't thank you enough for that. Well, and that's a message from us as Unistoten. And I just want to thank everybody else here that has sacrificed their time away. And I've heard Unistoten quite a few times since I've been here last night listening to Caleb and his strong message. Every person that spoke really spoke deep into my heart and my soul. And I thank every one of you for that. Awitsa. Thank you. One last question. Uh, I've been told that uh, the live stream is now ended uh, and uh, to close. So we're going to bring this to a close right after Donna's question. Grand Chief, uh, I wondered if I might request on behalf of myself and perhaps uh, all of us, many of us, uh, you have certainly uh, walked the talk uh, back east in uh, 
that part of Canada where I myself was born, Atlantic Canada. I wondered, Grand Chief, if you consider honoring us with uh, some reference to one or two of your specific involvements in uh, Atlantic Canada in past years. Thank you. I have, um, you know, such a passion for for what I do, and some of you know my story, but um, I was apprehended when I was nine months old, and I was raised in care, and. Uh, it's a very lonely, dark place for an indigenous child to be raised um, away from their family and out of their community and in complete isolation. And so I grew up not knowing who I was. And when I was, um, you know, just um, a toddler, it didn't really mean a lot. Uh, my caregivers looked after me. And, you know, I had a roof over my head and, you know, I was uh, well looked after. But it wasn't until I started to get older that I began to realize I was different. Um, you know, racism is still very much part of uh, the social um, ills of this country, I suppose. Um, which I suppose, you know, is it's a very young country. But at any rate, when I began to grow up and go through elementary and high school particularly, I began to realize being indigenous wasn't at the top of the, you know, the proverbial totem pole. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> particularly when I took an interest in, in girls. And uh, it was an interesting dynamic because in the classroom, I, you know, I was, uh, people would socialize and, what not, but if there was any consideration for going out to the movies or anything like that, it was an entirely different story, right? And uh, mind you, I did marry my high school sweetheart who was non-native and, and, and so on and so forth. So um, I went through a real bad period of identity crisis and alcoholism and it was terrible. And um, miraculously, um, after I had married my high school sweetheart and we had uh, uh, two beautiful daughters who incidentally are both teachers now and they both came home. Uh, my oldest daughter teaches in our band school and my youngest daughter is up in the Vernon area. Um, at any rate, uh, uh, the marriage was, uh, you know, was, was um, as a consequence of my alcoholism, was really in shambles. Um, and it eventually completely broke down, and, and we were divorced after four years. But uh, just before that happened, um, my father took it upon himself to come looking for me. And the policy back in the time I was apprehended, which would have been about uh, 1950, uh, it absolutely forbid any contact between the apprehended child and um, the family. So everything was secret, all records and so on and so forth. But um, my older sister, uh, saw a letter at the band office you know, because all of my clothing and school supplies were paid for by the Department of Indian Affairs as I was being raised in care. And so she found out I lived in Quinell. So my dad uh, didn't own a vehicle. He didn't know how to drive. It took three people to teach him how to drive. He was very gruff. Uh, his, his nickname was Sarge. And everybody... <laughs> People were afraid of him. He had these big Popeye arms, and he had a brush cut. And, and so he bought a vehicle, and he drove to Quinell, and right out of the blue, he, he dropped out of the sky into my life. 
and uh, I ended up going home for a visit. And I can tell you that was, that too was miraculous. Uh, I was in our community for three days, nonstop uh, line of people coming into my father's house, all of my relatives, um, tears, lots of tears. Um, the elders all spoke fluent Okanagan. They'd be talking to my father, and they'd be crying and making motions like this, because I was a baby when I left. <coughs> and it's amazing. It's an amazing magic. Because that th short three days that I was there, I fell in love. Um, I, you know, I got to meet my mom. Uh, my mother and father lived at absolute opposite ends of the community. They had been separated and divorced for a long time, and they couldn't get further away from each other. <laughs> but uh, the short time that I was there, and at the same time knowing the marriage was over, I thought to myself that I was going to come home. I knew I was going to go home, and, and I did. I went home, and um, I was one of the very few people in the community that graduated high school. So I was taken into the band administration, which was relatively a new creation. Everybody had a brand new band office, um, <clears throat> single wide trailer gravel parking lot, one single utility pole out front. And I began to learn about the history of our people, the true history, because going to high school, I learned about the courageous settlers and how they carved this country out of the wilderness and you know how the RCMP bravely came across the prairies and chased out the whiskey traders and saved the Indians. and. No, I learned it all. I learned about Sir John A. and, you know, driving the Golden Spike in and stuff like that, right? And when I went home, I learned the truth. And um, a number of things happened, but one was um, anger. Like this anger began to well up in me. And one of the things I was angry about is, is I... Uh, felt that my childhood had been stolen. And the fact that I didn't speak our language just was really something that was hard to, you know, to, uh, to live with. And uh, the more I learned about the history, uh, the angrier I got. So I had long hair, a military fatigue jacket, uh, sunglasses, red headband, I alternated between a red headband and a black Billy Jack hat. <laughs> and I was so angry. And I had uh, Vietnam jungle combat boots. And I had a chip on my shoulder, and I hated authority. I hated anything in a uniform. And I blamed all of the above for the fact that I was taken away. And, and whatnot. It took me a long time to work through all of that and begin to realize that, you know, all of the, those things that happened to me is what put me in this chair here today. It took me a long time to, to know and understand that. And um, so that is the fire inside of me. And, and it was interesting, uh, I was sitting in my dad's house he had 11 acres of land, and it was just jam-packed, choked with weeds. Um, it's called knapweed, and it's an invasive species. And I looked out at his yard, and I was young. I was in my early 20s, and I said, why do you let your yard get so messy? Because I grew up with the white picket fence, the mowed lawn, the flower beds, the trellises. And uh, he was shuffling cards across the table. And he just stopped shuffling. And he just stared at me, <laughs> stared right through me. And I thought, oh, no. And he just jumped out of his chair and walked out of the house. But when he got to the door, he looked over his shoulder and he said, come on. 
I thought, oh, great. You know, he's going to take me outside. And, and so we walked every square inch of his property through the nap wheat. And he told me what was planted there, what used to be planted there in terms of vegetables, fruit trees. And uh, um, he said that he used to sell his produce to the, the restaurants in town and the small supermarkets. And what happened is the government, in its infinite wisdom, uh, Ottawa decided we needed a transnational airline. And in order for that to happen, you needed the infrastructure. They needed airports to come all the way across the country. And uh, they were looking at our land, the reserve land. But it was a high water table. And it was marshy. And the same with town. 40% of Penticton used to be marsh. And so the engineers got involved and they said, well, if we channelize the river from here to the border, it'll drastically drop the water table. We'll be able to reclaim the land and build the airport. And that's exactly what happened. But what went with it was all of the small gardens and orchards in our community, the livestock, and everything like that disappeared overnight. And everybody cut down their fruit trees for firewood. And uh, the invasive weeds came in. And that's how his property got to be a mess as it was. But that was a pretty harsh lesson I learned in the August sun. As we stumbled around there for about an hour and a half. And that just fueled my anger. You know, I said, well, why didn't you do something? All of the gas lines, power lines, rail lines, the channelization, the airport itself, expropriated land. Because it's far easier to expropriate reserve land than expropriate land in a municipality. And that fueled my anger. And so that's how I got involved in the movement. I found the American Indian Movement to be very attractive at the time. I met my wife, who was involved with the Native Alliance for Red Power. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. Fifteen grandchildren later, um, both my wife and I went to treatment because uh, we both had issues and so on and so forth. And, and now... Um, you know, with uh, a good heart and a clear mind and a sense of purpose and an understanding that we're in this together. It's not just indigenous peoples. Like, we don't have a, you know, a, a corner of the market here. It's all of us. And we were all meant to, to do this work together. And I have faith that, that we will succeed. And... Um, that's what puts me in this chair on a Saturday, you know, talking about these things. Thank you. Augusta, would you like to say a final word? <clears throat> I'm really, um, it's, it's been a struggle for a lot of people who've been on the front lines and it continues to be a struggle. Uh, I got a lot of like really close friends that have made who were settler allies that came in and left and I don't think I'll be seeing them again because it's, you know, the stress of living on the front line like that takes its toll on, on a person, it takes, it, takes its toll on relationships takes its toll on community. And a lot of us understand that, that, that that's kind of a price you have to pay to keep moving forward, to keep the struggle going. And it's a tough, it's a tough one. You know, I talked about how many, what, what type of sacrifices, how far are you willing to go? You know, a lot of us have done that and are still doing it today. You know, it's a difficult journey. Um, 
I like what Caleb said yesterday about um, making sure that there, you have a self-care plan in place if you're an ally or if you're somebody who's working on the front lines because that's really important. You know, the, the police state, you know, corporate entities and the government will try and exploit any weaknesses that they can. They'll take full advantage of it. And we need community to make sure that we hold each other up. And this is a community that's here today. It's a community that's sitting in Moncton that's participating in this forum. It's a community of people who are out on the front lines right now, you know, enduring the stresses of taking on the state and the system, and the system is just failing them. And we need to make sure that we support all these people. We can't just sit idly by and kind of like it on Facebook or share it. We have to <laughs> do something. Get out on the street. Go to the MLAs. Go to the papers. Organize meetings like this. Go to those front lines. Do anything and everything that you can to make sure that change happens because your unborn children are watching you. You don't know it yet. They're watching you. They want to make sure that you're going to do the right thing. So do the right thing. That's what your ancestors did. That's why we're all here. Well, um, I pray that we continue to walk humbly with spirit guiding us and uh, with one another being able to talk and continue to have these kind of open uh, dialogue in opportunities as well. And thank you to the sister from Muskiam as we continue to live on this land together with you. Thank you. Thank you.